Hey kids, welcome to another show. My name's Joel. Uh, this is Ben. It is. Now with new and improved hair. And new and improved face as well. Uh, yeah, uh, so for, well, for, yeah, yes. First, uh, faces. Face stream that we've you can done. See our, you can see our faces, and um, so you can tell us apart now. I think it's good. Yes. I noticed in the first stream back for the year we had a very similar, similar hairstyle. It was, mm. it was very embarrassing. Uh, hey, great We're and great. Quite <laughs> similar kind of physique. Yeah, well, well like yeah, sure, sure. It's similar clothes. I've got a bit of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, what was I going to say? Grain and great. We're a homebrew shop committed to helping you brew better beer. Uh, I know that sounds like a line, but it is actually something we take seriously. Uh, helping you to brew better beer. It's a win-win. It, uh, you know, it's on the shirt. Time. And it, it is a slogan too, <laughs> but it is something we take, we, we pride ourselves in. So, um, you know, we do that by making videos uh, and, and um, non-comprehensible streams such as this one. Uh, so if that sounds like it might be at all interesting to you, please consider subscribing or um, hitting that notification bell. I've got no idea what it does, but apparently I'm supposed to say that you it notifies be hitting you. it. It notifies you, yeah. And and smash the buttons and such. So when we chuck up a video, you'll you'll get a little alert uh, yeah, on sure. your phone. It helps you keep abreast of all the yeah. uh, the stuff that we'll be uploading. And we will be making a commitment to uploading more content as uh, the months progress. Um, so today, Ben, it's a porter but not as we know it. Yeah, it's yeah. So we're doing Baltic porters today. Um, I, won't, I won't give too much away in the intro, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting style, um, and it's got a really interesting history, of course, <laughs> like all beer styles. But um, the way that you no. actually the way that you actually make it, um, and, and the kind of the ingredients and the processes you use, are, are sort of fairly unique for a porter, um, and it results in a really um, delicious beer. I think like, it's definitely my favourite of the stouts and porters. Um, but I've never brewed one before, so this is yeah. a really good opportunity to, to make one on stream for you guys um, and, and share a bit of kind of um, bit of info on, on the process and perhaps a style that normally it's not a style that I'm familiar with at all. I've never I've never seen a commercial example. I don't think I've ever drunk uh, consumed one. I think it's probably it, if I'm correct in assuming this is one of those styles that probably mostly home brewers you know really only get to drink outside of. The, yeah, there's the a couple. Baltic states, I don't so, know, like, either. I know um, there is a couple of Finnish examples. There's some Polish ones. Um, probably the most famous and, and the kind of the oldest one would be Lecoq. Okay. Um, and, and Poland has has a fair few. Um, Poland actually has a festival now. It's been okay. running, running for um, a while now, um, sort of five or six years, I think. Cool. Just a Baltic porters. Um, yeah, so right. There's, there's definitely. Um, it's still big where, where, where it, it comes from sort of thing, but yeah. um, which makes sense, which as, as we'll go into later. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a delicious style. But, and, and a style of beer that really lends itself to home brewing, because as home brewers, we like to brew beers that we can't find. Like a lot of, we talk on the show a lot about extinct beers that have been revived and just hard to find beers. And, and then this is probably an excellent example of yeah, something definitely. you can brew uh, and, and taste that you probably can't get it elsewhere, otherwise. Yeah. So, uh, cool, anyway, sounds like fun. Uh, chats, you know how it works. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat to the box on the whatever that side of the screen is. Uh, we may not get onto all your questions, so please don't feel bad if we don't. But hey, just if you wanted to say hi and let us know how, how good we're doing, you could do that as well. Um, all the comments help and uh, you know, we just, we just like to hear feedback and uh, what you guys are thinking. So yeah, tell um, me what I'm doing wrong. Do that, yeah. <laughs> we'll just wait for the trolley to pass. It wouldn't be a stream without us. It's all right, you can, you're okay. <laughs> it's, it's Finn. Yeah, fang it. Uh, it's Finn, everybody. That's a great show. It is all right. a great show. Uh, okay, I'm gonna get out of the way and let Ben take it from here. Yeah. Um, so we've already got it mashing. Um, we're, we're trying something new this week. Um, we've sort of been putting up a lot of four, four and a half hour streams, um, which can be a little bit of, I guess, a marathon. <laughs> so we're, we're going to see if we can um, condense it down this week. Um, but also, it's a 90 minute mash that we're doing with this beer. So if I didn't have it already going before we started, um, it could have become a five and a half hour stream. Um, but. There are reasons for the 90 minute match. 
There are reasons for lots of things um, with this beer. So I think the way I'm going to try to structure today is a little bit differently from normal. Um, I'm going to start off talking about all of the ingredients, um, largely because I think we've got a few videos up now that, that go through the, the brewing process, um, like the basics of it. So, so like what we're trying to achieve, why we're, we are holding it at sort of set temperatures for set amounts of times, all those sorts of things. We've got videos up now. Um, so we're going to try to focus specifically on, on the style. Um, we're going to look at the recipe, we're going to look at the process, and we're going to talk a bit about fermentation. Um, and then we're going to move into the history and things like that. Um, as we go along, that stuff might kind of get integrated into the processes and things like that. And, you know, like as we're going, um, if we hit across like a specific thing that we're doing, then maybe that might be a chance to talk about why we're doing that thing and, and the historical precedent for that. But like I said, we're going to wing it. We're going to see, see where it takes <laughs> us. Um, hopefully we kind of get a nice concise understanding of the style in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so let's start with the recipe. Uh, most of you guys, if you've watched these streams before, will know that I'm a pretty big advocate for really simple recipes. Um, with this beer, I don't know that there's a way to really do a super <laughs> simple recipe for it. Because um, there's certain things that you're wanting to achieve. Um, so I have basically managed to get it down to eight grains. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a light grain beer then? It's a step up from my usual one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, but... I've already hit that point where we're going to have to talk about the history yeah. <laughs> because it's not going to make sense otherwise. How you do you. Um, so basically, let's just start from the start. Balti porters. Um, so porter as a style, as a broad family of styles, um, kind of kicked off in the 1700s in England. Um, and it was more or less... a. I think the, the first porter was a bartender blending like beer from three different barrels. Kind of like, um, I heard it described on a podcast as like when you're a kid and you go into like the, um, say like Pizza Hut or Subway or whatever, where they've, they've got the drink fountains. Okay. And you get a little, bit of, little bit of each, each um, flavor in your cup and it, yeah. it tastes amazing. And yeah. you're like, oh, kids, come over here and try this. Yeah. If it's you mix kind of, too many flavors together, you just wind up with brown. So. Yeah. Which is what Which Porter was. It was, it was the brown beer. Porter was the brown beer. So I think um, this bartender had blended a little bit from this barrel, a little bit from this barrel, a little bit from this barrel, and then kind of, oh, this is really good. Everyone liked it. So it kind of became a thing that was quite popular, um, particularly popular amongst the porters, funnily enough, um, along the Thames. Um, which is why they ended up naming it Porter. Um, so by Porters, I mean people that would pull baggage off the ships and cargo and, and basically do a lot of manual hauling of heavy objects around the docks. And then at the end of the day, they'd go into the pub and they'd get themselves a nice, hearty, dark beer to kind of feel a bit better about life. Um, which is what beer's good for. Yeah. yeah. Beer always makes, makes it better. Especially if I guess... In those, moderation. Yeah, yeah, in moderation. <laughs> and in those days, I guess life was pretty hard, so... Life was pretty hard, so know. the moderation was probably, probably a little, not. Bit, <laughs> like, little bit less as less, well. Less uh, <laughs> of an importance. Um, but eventually, um, breweries, particularly bigger breweries, um, saw the trend really kind of rocketing um, and started producing them... As, as a beer, rather than kind of doing it as a blend, um, they, would, they would be produced, like bigger breweries in particular would be producing porter as something that they would send out from their breweries to different bars and things like that. Um, and about that time, so I think from 1750 to 1800, um, the export of beers from the UK jumped up by 76,000 barrels, which was massive, massive, massive amount um, for the time. Nowadays, probably not so big, but for the 1700s, 76,000 barrels was a big increase in beer export. Um, and a decent chunk of that beer was porter um, because that was the beer that was really popular and that was the beer that they were shipping and also tended to ship fairly well. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, um, yep. Big, roasty, heavy beer. Would yep, um, stand up to aging and... Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
So a lot of it was going to places like uh, the East Indies, um, South Africa, the, so like British colonies basically, um, and North America, like those kinds of places. Um, and we haven't done a stream on it yet, but I did do a demo a while back and we did an article in the newsletter a little while ago about Tropical Stout um, and yes. that shipping of those porters to places like the East Indies and um, South Africa was kind of where that stemmed from. And also the West Indies, um, places like Jamaica, um, was where that style kind of evolved from. Um, but Britain was also exporting beer to Northern Europe. Um, so they'd sort of sail up the, the coast of the continent, um, up into the Baltic Sea, um, and kind of the ports around there was where they'd drop a lot of that beer off. Um, now, when you've got lots and lots of barrels of sort of big, roasty beer sitting on a boat and it's going to India, um, you're going to be going through some pretty tropical, pretty hot sort of weather mm. and that's going to impact the beer in a certain way. When you go into Northern Europe, um, you're going into some pretty cold weather. Um, and so what was basically happening was you were getting um, effectively like a lagering type effect on those beers. Like they were, they were stored in these barrels and these icy cold voyages up into the sort of frozen north. Um, and these beers were, were effectively getting lagered and cold conditions. So by the time they reached Poland, Finland, Sweden, um, and obviously Russia um, via those countries, um, they'd, they'd effectively been lagered and, and cold hmm. stored and, and had significantly improved. Yeah, right. Um, when you couple that with the fact that they were, you know, big, boozy, dark, roasty, substantial beers, and I think most people that are into beer um, would kind of have that connection of cold weather and roasty beers, Yeah. Um, they understandably took off and they became really, really popular um, throughout, throughout the north of Europe, particularly the Baltic states and, and into Russia. Um, to the point that, um, so at this stage it was all porter, like the stout wasn't a thing yet, or, or it was like more of an adjective for porter. Okay. Um, so a stout porter was a heavy porter. So um, you'd have all these different varying strengths of beer um, and the heaviest strengths were kind of referred to as stout because they were big, they were heavy, they were strong. Um, so a really um, well-known example of um, one of these big, heavy, strong beers uh, would be the Russian Imperial Stout. Um, so named because the, um, the Russian Imperial sort of court um, fell in love with these beers like everybody else did, but became particularly obsessed with the strongest of them that were coming across. Um, and, and it sort of got names in honour of them, I guess, because all the, all the kind of royal families of Europe at the time were interrelated and you know, like, oh, well, Britain was probably friends with Russia at, at a certain point in time and said, oh, here we go, we're presenting you this Russian imperial stout. In so that's honor the of imperial the... part. Yeah, so in, in, honor of, yeah. in honor of how much you love this beer, like we're naming it in your honor and, and here's, I think it was Courage was a brewery that, that sort of um, got the honor of presenting that. Or, okay. Or so. Again, that, that's like a whole other story and we could go on a tangent sure. and talk oh, about Russian imperial that. stouts yeah. for, yep. for an hour um, if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of where that came from. Um, poor Darlings only had about 100 years to enjoy them uh, before um, history took a pretty yeah, massive sure. turn in Russia. Okay. Um, oh, right, okay. okay. But, oh, yep. but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they, they drank plenty of delicious stouts in, in, in those 100 years. Um, and then, of course, uh, I, I thought you were perhaps alluding to the fact that Pilsner came along and uh, that, no. was, that was later, I guess, or... So, so the, but I mean, not all, to go on a down a tangent. These, no, no, but a lot of these things were all kind of happening on a similar time, right. like, like in those sort of 1700s, 1800s, like um, a lot of the sort of European beer styles all kind of, that we know today, um, kind of were happening, like their genesis was sort of happening around the same period of time. Um, I'm just realising how completely and utterly I've gone off what I initially said I was going to do, but it doesn't matter. Um, we'll get because the recipe will make more sense with the historical context, I think. Yeah, um, fair enough. 
So around 1805, I want to say, um, Napoleon. Because um, that's another thing that was happening in Europe around the late 1700s, which I'm sure we're all aware of, was the French Revolution. Um, and the French Revolution kind of followed after the, well, I mean, the American Revolution, but also the, um, the English Civil War, which um, was sort of the, the first, one of the first times where we saw the peasants offing a monarch. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the same thing was happening in France. Um, yes. In the kind of late 1700s, so 1780s through to, or maybe late 1770s through to like the 1790s. And that was a very interesting revolution that led to some pretty massive changes and upheavals throughout all of Europe and the world. Um, one of the biggest of which was uh, Napoleon's ascendancy to um, the rank of em emperor, pretty much. Um, well, not pretty much, emperor of France and leader of the French army, which went around the world delivering their, um, their newly formed bourgeois democracy to the people of Europe. <laughs> um, so them and England didn't get along very well <laughs> in, in the early 1800s. Oh, goddamn England getting in. Um, in business. fact, most of the royal sort of families of Europe weren't too fond of Napoleon um, okay. and, of the Fran and of the happenings in France in the late 1700s because uh, they didn't want their people getting any ideas and um, uh. coming and knocking at their palace doors. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there was a bit of pushback, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, and at this particular point in the early 1800s, Napoleon had set up a naval blockade of England, blocking them effectively from sailing north to, into the Baltic Sea and into the north of Europe. So you've got all of these countries around the Baltic Sea, so Sweden, Finland, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, um, and Russia, obviously, um, have become addicted to this delicious porter um, and, and associated styles, which they've been, at, to this point, I think there was maybe one brewery had opened in the region, in Sweden, I think, it was a Scottish man, yeah. had opened a brewery. Scott um, in Sweden. Yeah, the Scots went to Sweden and started brewing porters. Um, but there wasn't really like, it, it wasn't a common thing. Like there was like, you know, one brewery in the area making these things. Um, but all of a sudden they were like, well, we need porter. We can't get it from England. We're going to have to start making it ourselves. So that's what happened. They, they, um, set up a bunch of breweries, um, and started producing their own porter. Um, and again, similar to the Jamaican stout story, similar to a lot of these regional sort of beer stories, like mm. where you've got like an existing style that kind of takes on its own character in a, in a, in a new place. Mm. Um, Based on the ingredients and the whatever. The ingredients that they had, they had access, access to, to was really yeah. what drove the development of this style and the climate. Um, so you've effectively got these folk that can't get access to English porter, but they also can't get access to English malts mm -hmm. for the same reason. So they need to use the continental malts that were available. So we're talking Pilsner malts, Munich malts, Vienna malts, those sorts of things, which were by this stage, um, I think, oh, actually maybe later, a little bit later, but um, it has started to kind of become a thing at this point. Like those <laughs> English malting techniques that we spoke about in the IPA um, episode, um, so like the drum kilning and things like that mm -hmm. um, made it possible to get roasted malts much darker without the addition of smoke. Uh -huh. um, yes, we yes. had so these are the um, new English malting techniques that were yeah, revolutionising. The they they made their way industry. to Europe at this stage uh -huh. in, in the early 1800s. Um, so they were doing their best to reproduce the beers that they had been enjoying, but with local noble hops with local European sort of continental malts. Um, and because the climate was quite cold as well, um, the yeast that they were using, I mean, these, these beers were big in Germany as well, funnily enough. Conservative, beer, beer conservatists, uh, Germany, um, were enjoying English porters. Um, and so access to lager yeast was quite, um, 
good as well. So, so they were able to get large yeast from Germany, they were able to get malt from Germany and Czechoslovakia and those sorts of places. Um, they were able to get hops um, from, again, Czechoslovakia, Germany. So that was how the beers were started to be made. Um, they were, instead of being fermented as ales with sort of warm fermentations and I don't want to use the term because I, I don't think it's a very good term, but top fermenting yeast. Okay. Ale yeast. Ale yeast, um, sure. Yeah. yeah. Ale yeast so can ferment from the top of the bottom, of a bit depending of, on which way. Want of a bit of word. Yeah. Um, but people know what I mean. Um, all of a sudden, these beers were being brewed with European malts, getting European malt flavour into the beer. They were being bittered with European hops, like SARS, um, which obviously has a very floral, very spicy character. Um, and they were being fermented as lagers. Um, so with, with lager yeasts, cold temperatures, cold storage in the barrels. So the beer took on a very unique character and I think a very delicious character. But it, what I think it really did and um, what I think sets Baltic Porter apart flavour and aroma wise from like your Imperial Stouts is it cleaned up everything. Mm -hmm. It made it very crisp, very clean, very sort of... It's still a big boozy beer. You still get lots of like really intense, like I think anytime you put enough malt in mm -hmm. a small enough amount of water yeah. um, and ferment it, you're going to end up with like really complex dark fruit, plum, raisin, sort of interesting complex flavours and aromas. Um, but it's sort of cleaned all that up and made them sort of brought them to the fore and mm. really well being a lager yeah it would be a different it would have been probably different to a lot of things at the time wouldn't it uh, completely unique yeah really um really interesting um russia actually funnily enough um there was a bit of a superstition that um they couldn't make a good porter in russia like we, you had to get them from england <laughs> so um russia was one of the later places that set up breweries um, to make these things. Um, but there was one set up in St. Petersburg, I think, uh -huh. in, the, in the early 1800s. Um, but eventually, like, heaps of these breweries were opening up. And even after the blockade had come down um, and boats were allowed to get back up into the Baltic Sea to deliver porter, it had become enough of a thing of the local stuff now that, that, that a lot of these breweries kept producing their own and, and, and a lot of the punters kept drinking them. So... Um, by that stage, this, the style existed. It was a thing. Um, and it carried on being a thing. To this day. Um, it's, it's, there's still... Um, we were talking about it earlier at the start of the stream. Like it, it's, it's fairly hard to get your hands on a good Baltic porter um, in this deep in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, well, um, especially, yeah. Sure. You definitely can. Um, you can even get like the European ones as well. Um, but um, it's... Like, Pol like I said before, Poland has a festival, um, which, you know, kind of a festival for a, for a style that, that sort of isn't... isn't that no one wants to drink. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a basic overview of the history of, of the Baltic Porter. Yeah, um, okay. And it's kind of like carried through, made it through the world wars, made it through... Everything else survived. Yes, yeah, survived this day. Like style survived and, and kept on going. Any other. I think you needed a beer um, in in Europe in, at that time. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, and I guess, like you say, the cold climates lend themselves to that sort of style of beer. Uh, if you were to look for a commercial example down here in Oz, would it be something you'd have to find in a boutique bottle shop, or Not have you ever seen it come across in Dan? I think it's one of those things where. Yeah. Um, Whenever you're talking about an imported beer, the beer has to be big enough to get international distribution to make it down here. Yeah. So generally, if they've got international distribution, they'll probably get pretty good positioning in, in like the sort of bigger bottle shops. Um, and it's not a hard and fast rule, but Is generally speaking, so like a good example, when I went to, I bring up my New Zealand trip every time, it's one of my sort of favourite beer trips that I've been on. But one of the things I found was that they had about the same hit or miss rate as we do over here in terms of breweries and beers. But, um, and I had a, such a high opinion of them going over and I realised this because every New Zealand beer that I drink here is good enough that someone has like wanted to send it overseas. Yeah. Um, so you, you get a bit of that um, survivorship bias, okay. I guess. Okay. Like, yeah. like the beers that make it here are the ones that are, that are worth kind of writing home about. 
Yeah, I um, not tried it. There's a, I say, I've seen it again in, in the bigger bottle shops. I don't even know how you pronounce it. It's quaka or something. It's got a goat. Is it on the, on the label? I think it's a lager. It's a dark lager. I, I don't think it's a, a Baltic porter though. I'm just if it's got a goat, it will be a bock. Bock. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So right, I so think bock is German that. for goat. Ah, and a lot of, uh, or it's something like that, and a lot of a lot sense. of box have sort of the goat imagery, and, and yep. goats are like really common. Yep. Um, I don't know if it's like a direct translation of yeah. goat, but sure, there's it, definitely it, a connect, like some kind of language connection to bock and goat, and and um, a lot of German box will have goats or some kind of pun about goats in the name, like yeah. something along those lines. Okay, cool. Um, but Lecoq. Um, so L E C O Q um, is one of the oldest breweries still doing Baltic Porter. I think they're Polish as well, um, and probably one of the most well known. Um, I think there's a few good Polish um, breweries doing them. Um, I'm trying to think. There's one that I'm not sure if it's a Baltic Porter or not, but I think it's a Czech one that's quite popular as well. Like mm -hmm. a dark Czech lager. But um, yeah, Lecoq is the one that I would probably look for and you might be able to find in, in, um, in bottle shops. But because we're talking Northern Specific. and sort of moving into Eastern Europe, um, if you go into like the beer section, go to the dark beers and look for like lots of syllables and not many vowels. Oh, okay, okay. You, you'll probably um, accidentally stumble across <laughs> one or two. Yeah, umlauts. Should you look for all umlauts? the Y's and the Z's? Okay. And the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. K's and the yeah. Okay. Not a lot well, of A's, A's, ISOs, or U's. A little tip there. Uh, do we have any chat? We've got a few things coming through. Yeah. Um, actually, we just got one uh, comment. I think Craig. Um, let me just pop up here. Is uh, asking what a few uh, all Omnipolo um, oh, there we go. Baltic porters pop up down here so um, yeah there would be a few yeah okay saying there would be a few uh, Omnipolo Baltic porters pop up, popping up around so yeah yep okay awesome. yeah so keep your eye out for those uh, Omnipolo are uh, a tidy little brewery so yeah definitely yeah delicious um, and make them <laughs> hopefully, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, exactly. hopefully yeah. people yeah. that are here um, are, are Which brewing. is the point, isn't it? Of this um, and and I think it, it is It is a style as well that you can brew quite well with extract brewing as mm -hmm. well. So even if you're not fully into the all grain thing yet, um, I know that um, Brewing Classic Styles is a book that we really kind of spruik here. Um, it, it might be a little dated now, um, but okay. it's still got some really solid recipes in it yep, um, sure. for pretty much every style. And they do extract and all grain versions, versions. of every recipe in there. So if, if you are just kind of chilling at the extract stage, which mm. there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you're looking for a good extract recipe for a Baltic porter. It is a style that you can do quite well with extract. Yeah, and given the amount of grain you need for all, like it's, I don't know if we talked about it, but there's a lot of grain. I in got eight grab. kilos of grain. <laughs> <in this laughs> we, ground, we did a little bit of filming before the stream started that I'm I've actually trying. flipped the top filter support upside down to make a little bit more space in the malt pipe because I had it kind of pushed in and screwed on, like I had to force it down to get enough thread for the wing nut to catch. Push and it was it. like a brick in there yeah. and nothing was flowing through. So I've, I've, flipped, be the, um, I've flipped the top filter an Interesting, support. an interesting mesh. So I guess um, it is working. something you could either do full extract or supplement with a bit of uh, some, an adjunct, uh, yeah. a light dry mold extract. Chucking just, in just like one can of like the Munich extracts. Mm -hmm. um, in like the boil so like you could do like maybe um pilsner vienna and your specialty malts which we'll touch on the recipe in a bit um but you could do like your, your sort of your pilsner vienna specialty malts get like your five or six kilos into your into your mash mm -hmm. um and then once you hit the boil dump Chuck, in a Chuck, can of your munich extract and, and that'll that'll give you your gravity and your flavor that you're chasing and, and that'll be a really good easy effective way of, of, of achieving those numbers as well um, but, you know, we like to push things here. We like to yeah, we brew like to on the edge of difficult. <laughs> every system's capabilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Browmeister has Brown yet to let me it. down yeah. on any of the things I've thrown at it. I've really given it some abuse. Um, and it just keeps on delivering. So, um, yeah. 
So I think that Good. pretty much covers all the history that I wanted to touch on. Yep. Unless there's any other questions? Uh, no, so far. Uh, everyone, I think, is quietly listening. So awesome. maybe we should move on, yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about um, what we're actually putting in this today. Um, so malt bill, <laughs> as I was about to go into, and then I realised that you're not going to know why I'm using Pilsner malt for this if, if, if I don't talk about kind of how the star developed. Um, but I've got eight grains <laughs> in this. Um, I really like to limit all of my recipes to kind of max three, maybe four. Um, but there's certain things, there's certain flavours, there's certain characteristics that you're chasing in this style. Um, and there's also sort of certain historical additions as well, or things that are, that are traditionally put into it that I didn't want to miss out on either. Um, so I've kind of built a recipe around that. Um, but we'll talk about um, what the grains actually are, what percentage of the grist they make up, because I think um, percentage is more important than raw kilos because everybody's brewing on a different system, they might mm. have different volumes that they're trying to make. So if you know roughly the percentage, then I think that's a more useful number to have. And uh, for anyone interested, I will take a photo of that Ben's recipe and I'll put it, here, attach it in the comments somewhere um, so you can have a look at that if you like later on. And hopefully um, from this as well, like you'll have sort of enough information. Um, if you want to use this recipe, you definitely can, or try to sort of build your own as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yep. don't be afraid to. Yeah, there's, there's, there's certain things you're trying to hit, and once you know what those things are, then you can kind of play with it. Um, so in terms of the base malt for this style, um, you really want to try to get a nice, rich, even biscuity kind of character. Um, so it's quite common to use a light Munich or Vienna malt as a decent chunk of your base. Um, interestingly enough, the other thing that you're trying to achieve is a final gravity of around 1.010, 1010. <laughs> Which when we're starting at 1087 in this particular recipe. Yeah. Getting from okay. 1087 to 1010 using just grain and no sugar is a challenge. Um, so particularly in a dark beer where there's lots of specialty malts. So um, if you're using Munich as the entirety of your base malt, the conversion power of that Munich grain is, is going to be a fair bit lower than a, in a paler base malt. So you're going to be really struggling to get the fermentability out of it. Um, so what I've kind of opted to do is to use, so I've, I've got seven kilos of, of base malt um, total of my eight kilo brew. And I've gone with three kilos of Pils malt. And then I've gone two kilos each of Munich, of like a light Munich and a Vienna malt. Um, so the idea there is even the Vienna malt still got a decent amount of conversion power, um, but it'll add a little bit of that toastiness, a little bit of that kind of um, bread crusty, biscuity character. Um, and the Munich's really gonna bring that sort of, that breadiness, that toastiness, um, those sort of big oomphy malt flavors, which we do really want from this beer. Um, and the, the three of those together in kind of close to that sort of percentage, um, hopefully is going to give me what I need. So that, that's making up say 85% of the total grist of, of this particular recipe. Um, I've seen people talk about keeping your base malt for a Baltic porter to around 70%. Um, if you can manage to knock together a recipe that works in, in, at, at that amount, then definitely go for it. Um, I didn't really think that I was going to be lacking anything from, from knocking it up a little bit more. And I think as well, the Munich, the, calling the Munich a base malt in this context is almost sort of pushing definitions a little. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm kind of treating it as part, ba part base malt, part specialty. Um, in terms of the way I'm thinking about it. So I probably am, I guess, philosophically around 70% face malt. Um, 
in, in terms of kind of how the grains are behaving um, and, and what they're bringing to the beer. So, yeah, okay. so that, that's, that's my base. And it's a pretty, um, pretty beefy base. Sorry, Sorry no, you're, you're good. Um, pretty beefy base. But I'm hoping because I've got sort of five kilos that is just the pills and the Vienna malt, that that's going to be plenty of enzymatic sort of diastatic power, mm. as they say, um, to, to convert all the starches that we need to convert and get it to, to do what it needs to do. And I'm looking at it now, and it is still looking a little milky um, as it's coming off the top. Um, but I'll go into why I think that is in a little bit once we've gone through the rest of the specialty malts. Cool. And I'm um, um, oh, sorry to, to, no, no. to cut in there. Um, uh, we do have a question about mash efficiency, but we can get to that perhaps when uh, you've gone through the, the grain bill. But I think it might be relevant. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, like I definitely feel like we're going to get a lower efficiency than normal yeah. on account of the fact that we've got eight kilos of grain in a system designed to take five. Um, whenever I've done that in the past, I have seen like a sort of five, ten percent drop in efficiency. Um, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll address that a bit further for you, Tristan, as we go. And, and there are strategies that are in place, <laughs> which we'll touch on as well. Um, so the next kind of, I guess, subcategory um, of malts I've got in there is the crystal malts. Um, so really wanted to keep this below 10% or at 10% I've ended up doing. Um, so 10% or under of crystal. I think you need the sweetness, you need the richness, you need the kind of complexity of flavours that these malts are going to bring. But you don't want too many dextrins, which these crystal malts are definitely going to add, which is going to make it a lot harder for you to achieve that final gravity that you're chasing. Um, so I think once you start going over 10% with those malts, you're really going to struggle to get the final gravity down to where you need it to be for the style. Um, to be fair, lagering this with some lager yeast is going to knock a few extra um, points off. It's going to dry it out. It's going to kind of just a lead a bit more. Yep. Just a, you'll get a little bit more out of it, but you definitely want to be chasing. You'll get mouthfeel in this beer from other places. So it'll still feel full in the mouth, but it, it just won't be a thick, sweet, mm. heavy beer. Mm. Um, it'll be heavy, but it won't be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I think you guys get what I'm trying to say. Um, so I've gone with 400 grams of medium crystal. So that's going to bring like a carameliness, a sweetness, um, those classic sort of crystal flavors. And I have gone with British crystal. I know it's probably not historically oh, yeah. um, a, a purist sort of thing to do because this style developed because they couldn't get British malt. Um, I could have gone with like a Cara Munich 3 probably. Um, which would have been more historically accurate. Um, mm. It's like a German caramel okay. malt. Um, and honestly, now I'm starting to think, oh, I should have done that, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Um, I think most commercial breweries these days can get their hands on British malt and would be using it because mm. you get a different character out of it. I think that the, the German crystal malts are a little bit more acidic, oh, okay. um, to my taste, um, than, than the British ones, which are a bit more rich. Yep. Um, okay. And acidity is, I guess you don't want acidity in terms of like having a sour beer mm. in this style, but I guess you kind of want to limit the perception of acidity a little bit because you do want a little bit of chocolate to come through. And the perception of chocolate is inhibited by acidity. Right. Um, so, um, so yeah, okay. Again about that balance. Also I've been told. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, kind of limiting that sort of sharpness and acidity a little bit isn't a bad idea, which is why I've opted to go with the British, British crystal malt. But definitely, um, I think I'll probably brew this again um, because I'm already having a blast just in the research and the recipe design of making this. So I want to keep playing with it and keep um, tweaking it. And I, I love doing historical versions of beer, so I probably will do <laughs> one just using um, continental malts. I never would have figured that, you in history. Um, so, and then I've got 200 grams of dark crystal, again, British dark crystal, um, which is like 270 EBC. So the, the medium crystal I use is about 180 EBC. Um, the dark is 270. So halve those numbers if you're in America and you mm -hmm. wanted to know the lover bonds, um, halve those numbers and that's how many lover bonds. So say 90 lover bonds for the medium and about 135 lover bond for the dark. 
Um, I've got 200 grams of Special B in there as well. Uh huh. Um, so definitely a malt that they could have got um, from Belgium. Um, but also, um, I think Special B adds a really interesting kind of dried fruits, mm. raisins, raisins, sultanas yes. kind of character to a beer, um, which I think is going to be gorgeous in, in this context. Yep. We'll get a little bit of like those plums, prunes kind of things from the fermentation and from the, the high alcohol levels, um, specifically the high malt derived alcohol levels um, from this beer. You always get like with your barley wines, imperial stouts, your bigger kind of malt based beers, mm. you get those plummy, pruny kind of characters. So they will definitely come, um, but I'm helping things a little along bit more, a little bit a little with little the currants bit, and yeah. the raisins and, and those sorts of things with the special B. So, th so that's my crystal molds. Okay. So exactly 10% of the grist um, with, with like sort of caramel crystal molds. Um, and even that I think is probably pushing it. I could probably dial that back a little bit, but I'll see how this turns out. Um, like I said, it's the first time I've made this style of beer. Um, I'm going based on reading a lot of different websites, a lot of different recipes, and a lot of different people talking about the style. Um, and not just websites, I've popped open a couple of, couple of books as well. <laughs> <laughs> the old-fashioned Got to read theory, guys. You gotta, the theory, theory and, um, and then doing it. Um, and, and yeah, most of them sort of said 10% on it. So that's what I've gone with. I've gone with 10%. If I need to, I'll dial it back. Um, and finally, we've got the roasted malts. So this style, you do not want, and I think this is probably what separates it from Imperial Stout, other than those things we've already mentioned, is you do not want burnt, intense roast right. in a Baltic porter. Yeah. You want like a subtle hint of like chocolate, molasses, licorice kind of roastiness, maybe a touch of coffee, but you don't want burnt at all. Um, so no black malt. Um, I haven't put any roasted barley in there. Mm. Um, you po possibly could put a little of those things in there, but a tiny bit. Like you, you, you don't want the black burnt kind of thing that you get roast, from an imperial yeah, stout. The bigger roast. Not yeah. all imperial stouts, but some. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So it's, um, then that, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, the, it sounds like, so the color, the, you know, the stout of it, oh, sorry, porter, uh, <laughs> just comes from the sheer amount of character grains you're putting there. So like, there's another thing about this style. You don't want it to be black. Uh, so a Baltic Porter shouldn't be black. Shouldn't be black? Okay. Um, I've heard it described, I think this is a BJCP description, is anywhere from a deep mahogany through to a dark opaque brown. Yeah, right. So not and that what dark brown think. can be edging towards black, but you don't want it to be black. You want it to have colour. Um, and I guess that kind of ties into the not having that burnt kind of intense roast flavor as well, because um, by having less of those really dark roasted grains, you're gonna have less of those dark roasted flavors. You're gonna be less at risk of having those burnt characters coming through into the beer. Um, so right. Good. fortunately, we're in continental Europe in terms of <laughs> where we're drawing things from and um, one of the really cool things that continental Europe does with its, some of its roasted malts is it dehusks it before it roasts them. And that gets rid of a lot of those burnt, a lot of those acrid, a lot of those really sort of bitter roast flavors. Yeah, so think like your Carafa style. I mean, that's a... Uh, think exactly like your Carafa okay. style. Um, so most of the roasts that I've got in there is Carafa Special 1. So, so there's Carafa and there's Carafa Special. Carafa Special are the ones that have been dehusked. Okay. So we only sell the Carafa Special here. Um, and I've got 100 grams of that in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a heap, just a bit. Not a huge amount, especially in an eight kilo grist. Um, and it's the lowest color of the Carafas as well. Because even like I was just getting lower and lower and lower amounts of roasted malts and it was still too dark. Um, so I've gone with the Carafa one. Um, 100 grams, and then I've got 50 grams of, of um, chocolate malt. So again, I've gone with British. Um, reason for that is that the British chocolate malt has more of a chocolate flavour okay. from the other ones we stock. The other, the other one being the, the local, wow. the Australian yep. chocolate, White. which has more of a 
dark roast flavour. Mm. More coffee, almost. Yeah, it's coffee, way. and it's, it's a little bit sort of... You're starting to get a little bit of that burnt character in, in the... And nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's sure. Great, yeah, exactly. When you're making yeah, a stout, it, chuck it in there. Yeah. But for this one, because I wanted chocolate, but I didn't want burnt, I didn't want roast, I went with the British just because it has the right flavour that I was after. Um, and only 50 grams, like 50 grams out of 8 kilos of, of, the, of the chocolate malt. I keep saying out of eight kilos, it's it's 50 grams in a 20 litre brew is probably a better way to think about yeah, it. Because yeah, sure. it's going to add that much chocolateness, chocolate maltness to 20 litres of beer, regardless of how much other grains are in there. Same volume of water at the end of the yeah. day. Um, so yeah, 150 grams total of, of any kind of roasted malts, which makes up about 2% of the total grist. So crystal malt about 10%, um, roasted malt about 2%. Um, and the rest um, is your Pils Munich Vienna blends is, is what I've done with it. Um, you could put oats in there, um, which wouldn't be a bad idea. You'd get those gravity points off, but the fat in the oats would help fill out the mouthfeel. Yeah. So that'd be a good way to get the right texture. Um, while still getting your attenuation. Um, you, can you can add a little bit of wheat in there. That'll add a bit of malt complexity and a bit of sort of point of difference. Um, you can put things like biscuit malt. Um, brown malt is really, really common. Um, and that is, again, a historical thing. So um, before these beers were being made with pale malts, um, they were being made with 100% brown malt, which is most huh. of the early porters were. 100% yep. um, brown malt, um, which uh, Tom Davis, who used to work here, and is now head brewer at um, Exmoor. Exmoor, Exmoor Ales, Ales I think. In, um, in Devon, in England. A real ale um, yeah. place, which is very exciting. Um, but he actually made a 100% brown malt porter just out of historical interest. Um, yeah. And it, it worked. I think the thing is that what we call brown malt now is probably quite different to what they were using back then. Um, but it was definitely a really interesting beer and, and, and very kind of, um, yeah, it was, a cool, it was a cool thing to do. I recommend doing things like that if you're that way inclined. Um, so a lot of people put brown malt in their recipes. And I, if I was going to do that, I would have just substituted the chocolate malt probably for the brown malt. Mm -hmm. um, although mm. everything I read said you almost always have chocolate malt in a Baltic porter. So mm. maybe halved the chocolate mold addition and yeah. done half chocolate, half brown. Yep. Um, Tried to approximate what it, they were yeah. they would have had uh, back in the day. But at that point as well, I would have been jumping up to ten grains, and I was already freaking out at having eight. <laughs> yeah, so you. Like, I don't know why I was freaking out, but grains. I'm just not, I'm not a twenty grain recipe kind of guy. Mm. <laughs> I'm a two to three grain recipe kind of guy. Um, and that's it. That's a gris. Um, definitely no acidulated malt in this one. Yes, darker grains. We've got don't plenty need. of dark crystal, we've got plenty of roasted malt. Um, we are going to hit our mash pH target um, and possibly overshoot, depending on your water. Um, I've done the water chemistry for Altona water based on the 2020 um, water quality report that City West Water brings out every year. Um, and with my salt additions, which I just put five grams of calcium sulfate, two grams of calcium chloride in there. Um, reason for that is we've got about twice as much chloride as we do sulfite in our water. Um, so I'm just kind of leveling just, that a little yeah. bit. Um, yep. it, it is still on the sulfate side, but I think with roast beers, that's a, it does a different thing a little bit than it does with hoppy beers oh, yeah. or with, with other types of beers like roasty beers. I feel like having a little bit more of the sulfate kind of, I don't know, it just gives it a little something. Alert, Will Robinson. Uh, we forgot to turn off the foghorn, so just be aware of this oh, one. <laughs> yes. Um, we might. Uh, uh, we'll just wait for that to end. So I'll go turn great. that off. Do you know which one it is? The ox? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, while I'm doing that, that <laughs> so, um, and. We're, we're, they're obviously very, very busy in the shop. There we go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go run and turn that off. But just got a question from Garth, maybe yeah, uh, cool. while I run out. Yeah. Um, so he's, he's saying that some recipes, um, I'm assuming for Baltic stouts, 
well, I like porters, sorry, but stouts in general uh, recommend adding the at roasted malts at different stages at, at uh, um, uh, Warloff. Yep. And here's a Braumeister. Um, uh, so what would you recommend to achieve a similar effect? Either less quantity of roasted malts or put them in later in the mash. There's a whole bunch of ways you can approach there's, that, of yeah, course. There's a, there's a bunch of things. Uh, and I'll talk about them while Joel runs, yeah. <laughs> runs off to switch off the Klaxon. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a really good technique as well. And, and you get the colour and a lot of the flavour of the malt without a lot of the harshness from, from doing it that way. So that is an example of where you could um, maybe play with a few different types of roasted malts um, and you're not worried as much as of, about getting that burnt, acrid kind of character into the beer. Um, maybe throw in a bit of black paint and malt or, um, or some, some different types of chocolate and things like that. So like I've kind of tried to get around it by using the debittered, dehusked um, carafe malt as, as my roasted malt addition. And I still get a little bit of roastiness, I guess. Um, but I'm not so concerned partly because it is um, such a small amount of the grist and because I'm using the debittered stuff. Um, if you're wanting to do it in a Braumeister, um, you should be able to, depending on your controller that you have. If, if you've got one of the sort of really ancient, big white, chunky ones, um, I'm not sure how you go pausing mid program. Um, but if you've got one of the kind of modern touchscreen controllers, you can definitely pause the program um, mid mash. Um, and while it's paused, so m maybe sort of five minutes before the end of your mash program, you could unscrew the, pause it, unscrew it, put your roast malts on the top, just kind of get them a little mixed in and then clamp it all back down again and then run the end of your mash as you would and, and you'd be able to achieve that. Um, mm. You could also potentially, when you had the malt pipe raised, I've heard of people doing this, um, when you got the malt pipe raised, put them on top of the filter plate uh, and then sparge through. sparge through them and then get a little bit from that. I don't know that you'll get as much of the colour from doing it that way. Yeah. Um, but when I've heard people doing that, they really pulverise those grains as well. So rather than just running them through a normal mill, they'll like bash them right. and pound them. Um, similar to like coffee. Yeah, I was going to say like... like uh... so, so that you'll get more extraction from running the water through them. Um, so that's an option as well. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different ways that, that mm. we can kind of achieve the same thing. Um, and definitely um, all valid. <laughs> like that, you know, that... People are doing these things and, and getting good results. So, so it's definitely worth trying these, these mm. techniques when you come across them, if, if it's interests you if, if you, if it's something that you think you'd like to add to your repertoire. Um, and particularly, um, I know another positive out of doing that is that you're not getting the impact of those roasted malts on your mash pH. So if, if you're sort of struggling to get like if, if your mash, every time you do like a dark beer is going way over shooting your, your mash pH down into like the fours. Mm. Um, or even like low fives is not ideal for stouts and porters because like I said earlier, you don't want it as acidic. You want it kind of a little bit on the higher mm. side of the good range. Okay. So this is a 5.39 pH mash yep, that, today. Yep. And so, um, at, Excellent uh, segue here. No, no, you haven't had that yet. You were talking about um, your chemistry before. So no, no need, I didn't need to add chalk. I didn't need to add chalk on this one. Um, I did the chemistry and, and just, I was, was going to hit about 5.4, 5.39, 5.4, and that's where I want it. Yep. So. So, that, so that's probably a result. Uh, again, Garth was asking why no chalk. Because um, you're not using a heap of... You've got a lot of crystal in there, but you don't have a heap of roast. I only got which 150 really grams of dark in. malts in there. Yep. Um, and I was thinking about that. I thought, am I going to need to add chalk? So that's why I've made sure to do the water chemistry. And anytime you're doing a beer that you haven't done before, I mean, you should do it every time anyway, but sometimes if I'm in a rush because I'm lazy, I've made a beer a whole bunch with that particular water. Yep. I know that you can I'm going to need about this much acidulated malt to get it where it's going to be. Or I'm going to need sort of, like I know roughly what I'm going to need to do to the water to get it ballpark to just smash out a brew without yeah. keeping on calculating it. Um, but definitely if it's a new style you haven't done before, just plug it into a calculator, get a rough mm. idea of where you're yep. going to be. If you've got a pH meter, then definitely check it as well. 
Um, I'm not doing that today because we're in the middle of wine season and our pH meter is being used to test yeah. grape juice every five minutes. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to. <laughs> um, I don't want to, all manky and black and stout and portery. Um, so, well, it won't be black, will it? Because it's not a black style of you. Um, it'll be deep mahogany. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so I'm not testing it today, but the calculator that I've used, I'm never more than 0.1 of a pH out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Always. Unless you put in like the quantity and color of the grains that you're using, yep. um, and it calculates it based on that and your water chemistry, it'll give you like what you, its predicted mash pH will be, and it's always pretty much bang on. When I, I always check try it. to do it too. Yeah, Brewer's Friend uh, has a really good mash uh, pH calculator. No affiliation. We we do mention Brewer's Friend a lot, but it's just a, a convenient free resource for people to use. It really is. Um, um, and yeah, jump on there. Plug your grains. It's really easy to use. Plug your grains in and it gives you an estimate of your pH. I like the Brewer's Friend calculators as well. They cite all of the studies that they've based the yeah, calculators that, yes, on at the bottom as well. So at. it's not just like, here's my calculator, and use trust it and me. You'll, you'll succeed. It's like, yeah. so I've used the, this is how I've built this calculator. This is like the studies that I've based, like they show their what tools I've built it out of on and, and, and so yeah. like, yeah, they, they, they actually back themselves um, with what they're doing, which is nice. Because I don't understand all of that stuff. So no. it's nice that they're <laughs> saying, you, like, yeah, these yeah. people do understand this stuff, and yeah. this is who we've listened to when we've designed this recipe. For sure. <coughs> and it's finally starting to get less milky in there, which is good. Good. And so, perhaps, uh, quickly, so, you're just, you're, as far as the efficiency goes, to go back to, I think it was... Yes. Sorry, I can't remember who asked the question, but um, you're expecting the efficiency to be lower. That's just a given. A little lower, yeah. Um, but it's not going to be so low that it warrants um, doing a double mash or... I mean, you could do a double mash, you, definitely you could split could. it up. It's probably but is it, you know, a that's something smarter you make. thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you're on a Browmeister, if you're on a system that's designed to take five, maybe six kilos of grain, um, doing two brews of four kilos, probably not the worst idea in the same water. Um, and with like heavy sparging. Um, so at home, use your discretion, but of course we, we, we're, uh, we like to push things as you're saying. I, yeah, I and, like to uh, push it. Um, you know, and we're, we're moving into minute number 81 of 90 minutes, um, which brings us to one of the strategies that we're employing to okay. get... Oh, here you go. So that's... A, to get that fermentability and, and to yeah. get the most out of the mash. Um, so we're doing a 90 minute mash at 65 degrees. Oh, Tristan was the one who asked the question. Sorry, Tristan. Ah, cool. There you go. Um, yeah, so we're so. Doing, doing a 90 minute mash at 65 degrees. So I mentioned before um, that we want to get this down to 1010, 1.010. Um, which is pretty tough on a big beer. Um, so, 65 degree mash, fairly cool. I tend to go 67 degrees for most single infusion beers, um, but I want to get more fermentability out of the sugars that I'm extracting. Um, the trade-off for going a lower mash, and I could have even gone as low as 64, I was tempted to. Um, trade off for going lower mash is that the beta amylase, which is active at that range, which is the one that chops it up into tiny little chunks that the yeast can easily chew up, it moves a lot slower. Um, it can only kind of chop off um, starch molecules from the end of, uh, sorry, it can only chop off sugar molecules from the end of the starch atoms. Um, and I know I'm probably mixing up atoms and molecules, I'm not a chemist, I'm a musician. <laughs> well. Cut me some, cut me, cut, some me, slack, cut the guy some slack. Come on, man. That was my little. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm kind of giving it more time to achieve that. So if you're at home and you you weren't 100 percent sure that you're going to hit that in 90 minutes, um, you can do what's called an iodine test. Um, we've kind of spoken about it, I think, before. Um, and lots of people online will tell you about it as well, but mm, basically you yep. take a little bit of the wort, um, like in a spoon or something, put a drop of iodine in there, and if there's still starch in there, that iodine will go purple. Mm -hmm. um, if sufficient amount of the starch has been converted to sugar, the iodine will stay like kind of murky brown. Um, might be hard to tell in a deep mahogany beer yeah. such, as, yeah, <laughs> such sure. as this. Um, but you'll still definitely see like it'll it'll go like inky and black, um, 
whereas with uh, um, otherwise it'll, it'll kind of be its own sort of deep yellowy mahogany um, when you put it mm. in there otherwise yeah. like you, you'll see it'll be darker but it won't be like it'll go like it'll look pitch black um, yeah yeah in that sort of beer like because it'll go like inky purpley kind of you should be able to black. see the purple hue um, yeah. and you can just use iodine from the chemist yeah better yeah. yeah. works fine um, Iota 4, if you use that as a sanitizer, that works as well. Um, it doesn't take much. Um, I only know that Betadine from the Chemist works because I remember, and I know I've said this on stream before, grade three, um, science, we all got potatoes, big starchy potatoes, and put drops of iodine on there and watched it turn purple. There you go. I remember doing that in primary school. <laughs> Sorry. Um, or elementary school for any American ones. Um, and... That's how I know it works, because it's the same principle at play. Potatoes are full of starch, the iodine goes purple because of the starch. Um, so yeah, we're coming to the end of the match, which is really cool. Um, and I'm looking at it now, and I've been kind of periodically peering into it. And for a long time it was looking milky, and milky is generally a sign that you've got starch. Now it is clearing up, so it's just... It looks like we're towards the end of a mash. Yep, okay, so you know something's working. Yeah. And that, that's part of brewing as well. Um, you, like, the more you brew, the more you get to know what things should look like, smell like, taste like even. Um, I know I've brewed a few dark beers before. I know that like, when you're getting towards the end of the mash, um, when you look at it, particularly on a Braumeister, because you've got that nice filter plate to like, peer at it through. Mm. Um, you get like that nice thin layer on top and, and I know sort of roughly the clarity that I'm looking for um, with that and, and I'm pretty much there. Uh, which is good. So the mesh has worked. Um, and again, for anybody with a brow master, all I did was just flip the filter plate. That's not all I did. I, I did a few things to get it all, <laughs> cram it all in there. I was taking um, water from the tap and hydrating the grains at the top that were like still bone dry and crunchy and then chopping it all in with a paddle and then taking a bit more and pouring it on top, chopping it all in. So it took a bit of effort to get all the grain in the malt pipe, but I got it. Um, we got it hydrated, we got it chopped up, hopefully not too many dough balls. Um, flips the filter plate uh, on the top so that it gets an extra kind of that much space in there um, for the crossbar to hold it in place and uh, there we go. The, the grains are kind of threatening to spill out over the sides around the edge of the filter plate, uh, but that's okay. They, they haven't really gone in as yet, so we're good. Sorry, we can't show you this, people, but uh, if I tip it, you can imagine. Will go in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the mash nearly done. Um, in terms of, and this is, nearly brings us to the end of the end of the the Baltic yeah. Porter. Okay, right? all right. Yeah, um, sure so, so, so in terms of the hops. Um, I say nearly, we've still got a few things to talk about. In terms of the hops, um, any kind of European hops are good. So Hallertau, Tetnang, Sars, Perla. Um, don't know about Spolt. Spolt's one of those weird ones where I'd sort of, I'd say if you're making an alt beer, absolutely use Spolt. If you're making other types of beers, I don't know, mm, maybe. I've never used it. Consider no, using think. Spolt. It's got a bit of a, t a, bit of a twang to it. Okay. So it's def a very unique hop, which is awesome in an alt beer. Um, and that's mostly what it's used for. Um, Magnum is a good German hop, has a good German character. Oh, yeah. um, and you would make a very fine Baltic porter if you just put some Magnum in as your bittering hop, which was my initial plan for the day. I was going to put in 35 grams of Magnum, boil it for 60 minutes, and that was it. Um, but we didn't have any 40 gram packs of Magnum and I didn't want to like crack open an 80 to get 35 grams out, so we did have some SARS. And SARS is probably a more traditional um, hop. Um, Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic, as it's now known, quite close to Poland, quite close to that kind of part. It's sort of like as you're moving through Germany up into that kind of part of Europe. Um, <coughs> sorry, I get asthma if I'm talking for long periods yeah, of time. Yeah. Um, you're moving up through the kind of Czech, Bohemian area, up into Poland, up into like that kind of area. Mm. So SARS probably would have been a logical hop that they would have used at the time. Because um, rather than going all the way down to Bavaria to get Halatau, just uh, 
pop into Czechoslovakia, grab some SARS, and then back up to your brewery to throw them in your Baltic, Baltic porters. Yeah, yeah. I get, and again, it would have been whatever they had access to at the time. Yeah. So if that, that stands to reason. Would have been a lot easier for them um, to get their hands on some Czech hops. And there are other Czech hops as well, um, but they're not as accessible to home brewers. Um, yep. SARS is going to be really easy to find. You'd be struggling to find a homebrew shop that doesn't try to keep stock of SARS. Yep. Occasionally yeah, sharp, yep. yep. Yeah, but, we, um, but it's, yeah, you'll definitely be able to find SARS. If you can't find SARS, like I said, Magnum, Hallertau, Tetanang, Perla. Mm -hmm. any, anything European, Noble, those kinds of characters are what you want. Um, and I'm just doing, uh, I'm doing a 120 gram edition because these SARS have an alpha acid of, oh, hang on. So one of them has an alpha acid of 2.9, the other one has an alpha acid of 3.4, so. I'm gonna hold those up to the camera, just we'll show the people. So these are obviously packaged from different bags. So we, we label all of our hot bags um, with the alpha acid percentage. Um, so the 40 gram bag obviously got packaged from a different pack from the Czech Republic than this one. So ah. they've got different alpha acid percentages. So I calculated okay. it to need 120 grams. Um, so yeah, this might throw a spanner in the works. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. That's brewing. You gotta, you gotta sometimes just. Um, so yeah, if I was brewing at improvise. home, I would run off to my laptop and punch in the change to the recipe and see what effect it made, and then adjust accordingly. Um, but we're doing a stream, so we're not yeah. going to do that. We're just going to wing it. Um, but I was shooting, I've mentioned before, um, about the IBU to gravity ratio being a really handy way to think about how you bitter your beers, if, you, if you're chasing a certain style. Um, less so for big hoppy things, because big hoppy things you want to just get an amount of grams per litre in there to just blast oh, yeah, the yeah, flavour. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for a lot of beer styles, if you're chasing a style, one of the characteristics, the big characteristics of that style is going to be your starting gravity to your IBU ratio. So I was shooting for 0.3 to 0.5 to 1 in this for um, IBUs to gravity. Um, and that, I'm, I'm at about 0.35 to 0.4, I think, with, with this. So that might push me up to um, closer to 0.5. But that's okay, because... It's going to be a big beer, like we're shooting for around 1087, 1090. Um, so I can afford to have a little bit more bitterness to balance that. It's not the end of the world if, if it goes a little higher. Hopefully we won't go too high, but also a beer like this, you're going to age. IBUs are going to yeah. drop off over time, so you can and get away with it. I suppose uh, like a barley wine or any other such uh, we, we, what are we talking here like up around 10 percent uh, I, I can't remember if you probably mentioned that already yeah, yeah so this will be this will be a 10 12 10 to 12 percent um so you would age these beers anywhere mm -hmm. like minimum six months wouldn't you kind of thing i mean you can drink them as soon as you want but uh six months is sort of that i don't know unofficial sort of beginning of when the edge starts to get taken off up to 12 even um yeah. to stand the reason yeah yeah and I'm hoping this drops down to 10, 10, but I, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm doubting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I was doubting myself in the, <laughs> in the Lambic stream and somehow everything worked. So fingers crossed it might work. Maybe the, maybe the sites that I was reading were all wrong with their predicted end gravities. Yeah, um, well, well uh, it seems wild to me that you can go from 1087 just with grain all the way down to 1010. I yes. don't yeah. think, and, and it says as well that it should be a full mouthfeel. Yep. Um, so it's very dry, um, and, and typically, uh, just for those of you who are, to give you some context what we're talking about, um, uh, when you're using all grain, uh, making an all grain beer, uh, that is a very strong beer, has a lot of sugar in it, it can be difficult for the yeast to eat through all that sugar because a lot of that sugar is made up of more complex chains that um, create uh, mouthfeel and, and fullness, but the, the yeast can't eat them. So is it, it's partly because it's a lager yeast, is there a specific lager strain? Oh, using the 2206. The, the 2206 you said, yeah. okay. 
Um, but yeah, and, and without adding, having to add sugar. It, I, I don't think it's going to get down. But you don't think it will. I but reckon yeah. it was a typo uh, on the main sort of recipe site I was looking at. Okay, so all right. But who knows? We'll see. We'll see. It, it might work. And you'll, yeah. um, I'm, I'm probably, I would estimate from a grist like this, even with the Pilsner, I would probably estimate around 1020 to 1025. Uh, yeah, that, would, that makes sense. As more a finishing sense. gravity for, yeah. for a, an eight kilo grist. Um, yeah, for sure. That makes more sense yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. If yeah. it's 1020, 1025, I think my experience of drinking Baltic porters, limited as it may be, that would make sense mouthfeel wise for me. Hmm. It does talk about oh, okay. it does talk so. about having a full mouthfeel as well as the beer style. So forget the ten. I was talking about the ten ten before, and I'm yeah. as right. I was forget we don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. If you try to make this beer and it comes out at ten twenty five, it'll be delicious. Sure. Yeah, it'll be yeah. perfect, and don't worry um, about it. I think. And uh, this, you'll be fermenting this in the shop or at home? I don't know. No, um, I've, the West Coast IPA is still sitting there unfermented. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, which breaks my heart because <laughs> that beer was going to be yeah. pretty good. And unfortunately... Still could, still could put some yeast in there. We just don't know. Without the wall of beer at the moment, it's... Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the wall of yeah. beer. Um, I would argue that this is a beer you want to bottle more than uh, a keg. Yeah, sure. Like in my opinion, um, let it bottle condition, hide the bottles somewhere cool. Yes, and yeah, let if them you age, can. And, yep. then, and then open them a bottle at a time because I don't know that you necessarily want to be pouring a pint of plastic porter no. from your kegerator at like a nice cold temperature, nice and fizzy. Yeah. Um, although these are um, carbonated a lot higher than your stouts okay. and stuff like your imperial stouts, so this is like more of a like kind of two and a half to three volume. Um, carbonation level. Yeah. All right. All right. Sure. So yep. probably could higher than a sour, less less than a maybe maybe like pour pour your beer from your kegerator and let it warm up before drinking it. Might be the the go if you were to apologies for the burp. If you were going to keg it, um, otherwise, yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to put it in bottles. Just seems like the sort of thing you open a nice bottle of on a special occasion and. Yeah, e it's easier to yeah. age things in bottles than it is in kegs because yeah. if it's in a keg, there's always that pressure to get through it to free up the keg. Free up the space. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, on, we're on hops. So, so oh, yeah, sorry, so, yeah, so you want to shoot there. for... Nope. I think the style guidelines have anywhere from 25 to 40 IBUs, I think, from memory. Um, if I was sitting for my BJCP entrance exam again now, I'd probably fail in terms of knowing all the specific IBU ranges and gravity ranges of all the different styles. Um, but I think it's around 25 to 40. Um, this one should be about 35, 30, 35. Um, maybe a little bit more now because of, um, because of those slightly higher alpha hops. Um, and you can have a little bit of hop flavour in this beer if you want to. Um, it's not completely out of place. You want to keep it really low and you don't want any hop aroma. So you've got to be really careful. So if, if, you're, if you wanted to have a little bit of hop flavour, um, I would definitely make sure to use something like SARS um, or Halatau. And I would use a very small amount of it and I wouldn't put any in the boil after the 20 minute mark. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. Because you, you yep. really don't want any aroma. Yep, you don't okay. Want any so it's just, aroma you're just looking to be in this. If you want that little bit of floral, bit of... maybe spicy kind of character in there, then yeah, maybe 10 grams at 20 minutes mm -hmm. tops um, will give you that little bit of flavor. But I, I, I just, I'm not even going to try to chase it. Mm -hmm. um, we've mentioned before, I'll mention it again, I'll keep mentioning it. You do get flavor from your. 60 minute hops. Yes. It does give Agreed. character to the beer. Um, so if you're using the right type of hops at 60 minutes, you are going to get a small yep. amount of hop flavor. Yep. Um, and I think that small amount of hop flavor is about all you want for a Baltic porter. Okay, and you will get that for just- For me. Yeah, you're right, in the boil. You could add a little bit more at the halfway point, like you're saying, if you want a, a note. If you but really want to push really want to, the flavor up, 
to like the very edge of the allowable sort of perception threshold, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, like yeah. no more than 10 yeah. grams at like no later than 20 minutes. Being a stickler the, the style. Um, so yeah, for all you new brewers out there, don't listen to what people say about bittering additions only being bittering and nothing else, you will get flavour. You absolutely do additions. get flavour. Yep. Um, you, you get character, Yeah, I think is a better word than flavour maybe. It won't be the same as a late edition of course, but it will, something will carry through. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you use SARS as your bittering edition, you get SARS character in the end of the beer, even if you don't add any more SARS at any point. Um, so we are deactivating the pump, so we're moving towards, um, towards coming up to mash out. So I guess the last thing to talk about is fermentation. So this beer is going to be a challenging ferment. Um, you're basically going to want, well, so you've got two options. You can do it as an ale, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, if you're going to do it as an ale, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, I would use probably the 1728 Scottish ale yeast. It's got a yes, good alcohol yeah, tolerance. Okay. Yep. It's really clean. Um, it's going to chew everything up for you. Um, I'd use a lot of it. Um, so make a big starter for this beer regardless of um, what yeast you're using. Mm -hmm. So maybe like a two, three litre starter of 1728 to pitch in here. Um, we'll get you where you need to be. Um, maybe 1084 would be another good one. The Irish ale. Irish, use. okay. That's a little Again, less attenuating, nice I think. Nice and clean. But, but yep. Um, but if you really want to sort of make this beer in a way which makes it so special and so unique, I think using lager. a lager yeast is, is definitely worthwhile. Um, but it's not going to be easy. Um, yep. You've got pretty much no margin for error, I think, when you're making a 1087 lager. Like every single stressor, every single like challenge mm -hmm. for getting that yeast help to healthily chew up the the sugar is is kind of sitting in front of you. <laughs> like yeah, you've got yeah, you got it. Super high gravity. You've got low temperatures. Um, so you're really going to need to make sure that you're giving it plenty of oxygen, like really oxygenating the wort well. Um, huge starter, mm -hmm. like pitch way more than even the calculator tells you. Yeah, okay. Need. Um, you're going to lose some volume to like yeast gunk at the end of the fermentation, but right. it's going to be worth it for the, I mean, we're talking about a 10% beer. You don't need every last milliliter yep. out of the fermenter. Yep. Yep. Um, you're better off getting 18 liters of delicious, or, you know, like even 16 liters of delicious Baltic Porter than you are like 20.3 liters of kind of shitty poorly fermented. Yeah, something <laughs> like, that you've just tried to stretch every yeah. uh, every uh, milliliter out of. So so really pitch heavy with the yeast. Um, um, with, uh, you can't not do a starter. Yes. It'd be like this. Um, even if you pitch like 12 smack packs of lag yeast in there, you might have the cells you want, but those cells aren't going to be in pristine, healthy, happy condition. And you, you need your yeast to be happy you, and you've healthy got a, yeah, and fresh yeah. and vibrant and ready to go um, before you pitch them into this, into this wort. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And for anyone who uh, would like to know more about that, we do have a video on uh, making uh, starters. Uh, the live stream was a bit of a shambles, but I've cut it to get, I'm cutting it together into a video. <laughs> um, and yeah, we talk about all this sort of stuff. Um, how to build a healthy starter. Uh, we touch on lagers a little bit uh, and just why it's important and some tricks uh, to make sure your ferment is, uh, goes uh, as well as possible. So yeah, um, keep an eye out for that. Um, and that would definitely be relevant yeah. if you're making this kind of beer. Particularly because for this particular type of beer, I would recommend very strongly doing a step starter. Yeah, okay, building it um, up. Building like it up. So I would do a, maybe a two litre starter initially. Um, let that kind of do its thing on a stir plate, get it, get it to where you need it to be. Put it in the fridge, let the yeast drop out and let the clear liquid settle on top. Pour that clear liquid off carefully to leave the creamy yeast behind. And then top it up with cooled 
boiled. Mm. Um, so don't put boiling wort into yes. your, into your uh, flask. A sanitised... Boil it. Yeah. Cover it in the vessel that you're boiling in so that the vessel is, is sterile as well. Or sanitary as well. As sanitary as you're going to get it. Mm. Um, once it's cooled and once your initial starter has settled, yep. decant the liquid off your initial starter and then top it back up again with your cooled boiled starter mm. to maybe another two litres. Mm -hmm. Get it back on the stir plate, run it again. Um, you might even benefit from doing an extra one yeah. litre after that, yeah. potentially. You, you really want to get those cell numbers up and you want to get them fresh and healthy and happy yeah. and ready to go. Another thing you could potentially do, which I think isn't a terrible idea, um, maybe if you are doing a third one litre like little kind of top up starter, using a dark malt extract for that little starter. Uh, okay, so yep. And then, because one thing that I do with a lot of my lagers that I've seen a big improvement in the fermentation and particularly in the attenuation, which is something that we're really kind of chasing here, is pitching the whole starter. Active. At high Krausen yeah, on the yeah, starter. So yes. like when the yeast is still going, it's at temperature, it's, it's active, it's moving, getting it in there at that point so it gets a mm. running start on the beer. So that could be something that you could benefit from here. Yeah. Kind of like, a, I guess it's a vitality starter is, is sort of, but you have already gone through the steps of building the starter first. Yeah. Uh, for and I would, I would consider maybe if you were going to do that, instead of doing one litre, maybe doing 500 mils. Yeah. Um, if, if that's possible with the amount of yeast you'll have in your flask at that point. Yeah. Um, but but you, you've always got to be mindful of how much, like what the percentage of the liquid that you're pouring from your flask in versus the liquid that's mm. in your fermenter. If you're adding a litre of kind of just malt extract that's been fermented awkwardly mm. into 17 litres of work you've worked hard to produce yeah. that's like a good 20 percent yeah it total. will have a flavor impact won't it you'll taste It'll, yeah it come through and, and the starter and you don't want that so we yeah that the uh, stepping up starters is something we didn't go into a lot of detail on in the starter stream um i really love the opportunity to be able to do that stream again i think i was all over the shop that day <laughs> but you know what getting in front of a camera when there's no one and like presenting to kind of a camera versus presenting to people yeah, it's, it's, it's it is definitely, a different, uh, it takes a bit of getting used oh to. Oh God, and the mask was riding up into my face and it was, anyway. Uh, the information in there is relevant, so I will make a video about it and um, I think we'll redo it at some point. But um, uh, yeah, as Ben was saying, um, starter is important. For if you absolutely can't manage the step up thing, then I would suggest pitching three smack packs into your two litre starter. And then that way you'll hopefully get um, the cell count that you need. Um, and whilst also kind of, when you do a starter, you're sort of resetting the vitality clock on your yeast. So you, you, your yeast is at 100% vitality once it comes out of the culturing facility yeah. and goes into the packs. And then as time passes from that point, that vitality drops off. When you do a starter, you're effectively resetting that vitality clock to, to 100%. Mm -hmm. like your yeast is healthy, happy, healthy, it's, it's day one again. And that's the yeast that you want to be pitching into your beer. Um, I mean, you want to be pitching that yeast into all of your beers. Yes. But you can get away with um, less happy, healthy yeast in certain things, yep. depending on kind of the degree of difficulty for the yeast. Um, some of the things which make it harder for yeast to ferment beers is high gravity, mm -hmm. um, low temperatures, yeah. <laughs> high alcohol. Yes. Um, and we're kind of ticking all those boxes with this one. Everything that's in this beer yeah, uh, um, so, will make it difficult for that yeast. So you kind of, you want to make sure you're doing all the best, you're ticking all the best practice yeah, boxes yeah. you can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well. something, something um, maybe uh, a, a challenging beer to brew and um, something to maybe do one you've got a few lagers under your belt mm. and you know you're looking for that next challenge um maybe this could be it could be it yeah because once you've got um once you've got all the you kind of your classic lager techniques sort of unlock 
um, like you're oxygenating your wort, um, you are pitching your yeast, you've got your temperature control where it needs to be, you're able to actively monitor the ferment and um, you know what it should smell like, should taste like at different times. You are able to intervene in appropriate ways to help get the last few gravity points mm. off or to maybe like chew through any diacetyl mm. that's kind of kicking around. Like if you know those, those kinds of things, those things are more likely to pop up as problems in a ferment like this. Um, so if you're kind of across those active interventions and, and you know sort of how to monitor a lager ferment, then once you've kind of got the yeast to where you need it in terms of cell count and vitality, you pitch that in there, mm. you, you're doing something you've already done before. You're yes. fermenting a lager. Yeah, you got less. Um, so it, you may be more required to intervene, but if you know what those interventions are and how to perform them, then you'll be fine. It's you'll less get, you're, not, you're not having to work it out for the first time and stumble and panic and all that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you could do this on your first... Yeah, well, hey. Like, like if, if you just follow the you steps, you. Yeah. Um, this could be your first beer. Yeah. Um, you, you're just going to have more of a challenge, but as long as you're doing all the right things, then it'll work. Yeah. It's, it's just making sure you're doing all the right things. And, and having that experience and, and those sort of sensory cues just helps. Yep. Helps to achieve that. Um, I think... Oh, I should mention as well, 2206 Bavarian Lager. That is the yeast that I would use. Um, okay. Not just because of my favourite yeast, um, <laughs> but I think that's going to give you the character that you're chasing. But you, mm -hmm. could, you could absolutely use a 2124 as well. That'd be really nice, which is the Bohemian Lager. Um, and also would be kind of geographically accurate, again, for the same reasons. Like Bohemia is much closer to like Poland and... Yeah, right. Okay. Um, ...things than, than Bavaria. Yeah. So okay. it would be, I guess, a geographically accurate choice. Although, as the story goes, um, the Czech breweries stole the uh, yes. their yeast from Bavaria. Um, but the 2124 is a Bavarian yeast. It's, it's the Weinstefan um, 3470 strain. Um, so it is still a Bavarian yeast. Um, but you want to get that malt expression in this beer, I think. Um, which you're going to get from either of those, mm. realistically. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, exactly. but they'll yeah. both attenuate well yep. as well. Um, I wouldn't use the Munich Lager yeast um, because it has a tendency to kick off diacetyl to the point where they um, YS brings out a Munich Lager too, um, where it's literally like it's like Munich Lager, but now with less diacetyl. Okay. <laughs> so like they're aware, like right. it's, it's a well-known thing that thing it does that. that. And right. in a beer like this, you don't want to have to be dealing with any extra challenges. Um, so um, I would go with, with one of those two, the 2124 or the 2206. Um, and just keep an eye on it. You, you mm, really you are got to baby it. almost definitely going to have to ramp up the temps towards the end, I think. Um, just to chew off those last gravity points. Again, I don't know that you're going to get to 1010, but mm. If you're sitting at 10.25 and you just bump up the, the temperature a little bit up to kind of 15 degrees, you might get it down to 10.20 and that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, are you, able, are you on, on the internet, on the computer? Um, I believe I could probably... Um, I've got my phone on. Yeah, yeah okay. Just, what, what do you want to look up? The, um, BJCP um, vital statistics for the style. Just to double check yeah, on it because okay. like, it, it really does feel wrong. <laughs> It definitely feels wrong for it to be a test. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and I don't want to give the wrong information to anybody out there. I don't want you, like, beating yourselves up because you didn't get a 1080, 1090 work down to 1010 <laughs> in a lager fermentation. <laughs> let's go on an adventure. Uh, BJCP, Baltic Porter, let's have a look. Just bear with me while it loads. This... Uh, this computer is multi-threading like a maniac. Yeah, yeah, it's working hard. I could just pop overall over that. impression. Ah, oh, it's right. No, no, I got it. I just got to go. Uh, vital stats: six point five to nine point five. Final gravity: ten sixteen to ten twenty four. There we go. Don't try to get ten ten on your beer. I was like, there's no way that's right. Yeah. I, no, like, as I'm saying it, I'm like going, oh. 10, 16 would be a nudge even. 
Yeah, I reckon shoot for 1020. Definitely shoot for 1020. Um, I have no idea why that... It was the last one I was reading um, for the recipe. And it even made mention of that as well. Like it didn't just have it listed as a stat. It talked about it. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, 1016 to 1024 sounds much more sensible um, for a beer of this size. Um, shoot for 1020. I would. Um, nice. Yeah. And, and that'll give you that nice full mouthfeel that you want yeah, from the yeah. beer as well. Yeah. So glad we did that. <laughs> yeah, good. So, yes, we It was, it was a very sort a of panicked rush um, yeah. yesterday getting the recipe um, put together. I had read a lot of stuff leading up to it, but yesterday was like the panicked rush at the end of the always busy days here yeah, at Grain yeah. and Grape. I work in the mailroom through the week and it's always a rush to beat the posty with all the all of you guys' orders. <laughs> um, so it was like the last 20 minutes of, of kind of frantically actually doing the recipe and then, yeah, sure. um, on the on the compute on the company's beer smith. Yeah. Um, and and I had that that last page open <laughs> while I was like making sure my percentages were right and stuff. I was like, oh 10 10, okay. Okay, yeah. Let's try but all right then. Yeah. Whatever you say, 10, internet. 1020. Right. Shoot for 1020. Um, so the mesh is almost over. Um, we're in our last two and a half minutes of the mash. Um, and then after that, um, we're just going to bring it to the boil, chuck hops in it, put it in the cube. So, seen that a bunch of times, probably don't really need to. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. so what I'll do is I'll put it out to the chat. Are there any questions? Are there any other things that people wanted to ask? Or maybe people have made this style a bit and, and have mm. some, some kind of thoughts on it? Some good tips or pointers or... Yep, so let us, let us know, um, yeah, re relating to Baltic Porter, uh, so as you probably noticed, today we focus more on the style more than the process. Um, yeah, we have done videos on um, the various aspects of brewing, but um, in future we will be doing more streams that focus on particular uh, topics. I believe Helen uh, has a demo upcoming about dry hopping, it'll all be about just dry hopping, so um, there'll be some good tips and tricks there. Uh, and of course, we also have uh, videos online that go through the brewing steps one by one, uh, how to brew in a bag. Uh, we've got a yeast rehydration video and a no chill video as well too. You'll be no chilling this beer, I assume, I will Ben, indeed. at the end? Yeah, definitely. Um, perfect candidate for no chill as well, the, the more malt driven beers over the hot ones. Um, I did notice on our brew in a bag video, someone had mentioned um, that you shouldn't do the no chill method with a hop driven beer. Um, okay, yeah. Which uh, we, like, I, I've only, like I do have chillers at home. I have done like fast chilled or rapid chilled beers. Um, I've got like a plate chiller and I've built an immersion chiller at one point, um, which ended up selling to a customer um, here. Who oh yeah. Uses it a lot and I okay. think he's happy with yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I've, you just learn to... You adapt the, the yeah. pr recipe to fit the no chill. So yeah, that's, um, and yeah, that's something you got to... Plenty of really nice hoppy beers yep. um, without any, any issues. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so it can be done. Um, uh, okay, so we got uh, a question um, saying that they don't have room in their brew in a bag for a huge grain bill. So mm -hmm. I suppose a small, maybe stove pot? Um, maybe a small pot, small bag. Possibly. Um, uh, can I mash twice half with half uh, the grain it, bill in each batch? The size of the bag or the size of the pot? So, um, Eris, I think, am I getting your name right? I hope. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess it depends on what, what equipment is it that is, is the limiting. Is it the size of your pot or the size of your bag? Uh, I guess to answer your question, yes, as well. You can just do a double mash. What you're suggesting is called. Um, double mashing, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah, mash half the grain in your pot and your, and your bag, one hour, uh, pull it out, squeeze it, and then you would just put in the fresh, another, you know, pull the, sorry, pour the spent grains out, add your, add your second half of the dry grains in, and then you just do a mash in the same um, pot. You might want to top it up with a bit of extra yeah, water. And, and depending on what the limiting factor is. Mm. Um, you could just buy a bigger bag. 
or yeah, if, I mean, if the grain just like, doesn't physically fit yeah, in the bag, um, then yeah, we we definitely have bigger bags. Um, if it's getting the grain and the water all in the pot at the same time, you can just use less water. Yes, uh, yeah, use less water. So um, and then add water in um, afterwards. Saying so, or, or they're saying it's the size of the pot. Can't okay. fit, can't fit in more than four kilos. So yeah. So with the water or uh, with more than so is it, uh, they're just saying mash pot overflows with more than four kilos. So, so that, that could just be um, using a bit less water. Um, so brewing a bag has a much uh, looser mash um, than a lot of more con like sort of traditional brewing styles, um, which leaves you a lot of room to kind of thicken. Yeah. Um, so so you can yes. you can definitely. Yes. Um, Depending on the size of your pot, um, which would, would be a good good um, number to know as well, um, but you could definitely just um, use a bit more, use a bit less water. Use a bit less water. See um, how long have it thicker away with. Yep. And then um, as you pull the grain out, then you can um, get like a. I'll grab one. <laughs> I need one anyway. Um, something like this, like a trivet. Um, sit the bag on top of that whether over your pot or over a bucket um, and pour water through that grain to rinse off any sugars that are stuck to it um, to hit your pre-boil volume in your kettle. Um, so if, you're, if, you, if your kettle's big enough to take four kilos of grain and to do 20 litre batches, you've probably got enough space in there to, to get away with it. It mm -hmm. just depends on the size of the pot. Like, it might be like a 30 litre pot maybe. Um, so maybe do... Okay. Yeah, okay, four kilos of grain is not... Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a larger pot. Pot, so maybe, yeah, sure. Sorry, well, I'm sorry, rambling. What size was the pot? Uh, he, he had, uh, they haven't said. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but uh, maybe if you did say 15 liters of water um, to your eight kilos of grain, that's sort of two liters a kilo. Yeah. So your standard um, mash ton mash is one and a half liters a kilo. So like on your kind of traditional esky systems, or like your traditional mash water ton systems. Um, your, your standard grist hydration is one and a half litres per kilo of grain. Um, mm -hmm. So if you were doing like 15, 16 litres of water with your eight kilos, that's mm. two litres a kilo. That's still definitely hydrated enough to, to do a proper mash. You still get um, activity. 30 litres. So 30 yeah, litres is, is, yep, 30 litres is a good size. And um, just sparge, sparge, yep. um, use less water at the beginning. So you don't, you're not doing what's called a full volume as we sort of show it in our Rota Bag video. Um, you, yeah, you just use less water at the beginning and then you top that water, I've been already saying yeah. that anyway, top it up with sparge through your grains with, and, and top it up to your final volume. Uh, sorry, 25. Okay, 25 litres still not... Yeah, it, yeah not it is, it is a little winning, um, but you, like, so eight kilos might be a challenge. Yeah, oh sorry, yeah, for I'm this, just trying to think. Yeah. If you've got, so if you've got eight kilos of grain, it's a 25 litres, did they say? 25. So that still leaves you with potentially like absolutely maxed out 15 litres of water in there. Mm -hmm. So you can still do easily do a one and a half litres a kilo ratio. Yeah, sure. That. So you sure. just do like a standard um, thickness mash. Yep. So, so like treat it, treat it like you would a, a mashed water ton or like yep. an esky mash ton. Um, get a nice yep. thick porridge in there, yep. do your mash and then um, pull your bag out and, and then you'll need to rinse um, You'll need to add back. Probably uh, 10 basically enough to get up to you. Get back to your maybe a pre, or a pre boil. Or so, yeah, you got a 25 litre. Yeah, so maybe like I say, 16 litre, 15 litres, maybe the, the mash. And then, yeah, it depends on what your, your, your batch size is yeah. as well, of course. But uh, top it up to your 20 litres perhaps or your 23 litres, you'll be nudging the top of the yeah. pot. But, <laughs> yeah, just keep an eye on it. Make get, get, your, get your, your no foam, your firm cap S in there. Oh, we nearly had a boil over. I forgot to post a video, actually. I took a video of the, um, I was going to put it on Instagram. We were making the Berliner Weiss work kit. And you always get this really thick, moussey foam that forms on yeah, top of the no, kettle it's cool. as it's coming to boil. And as um, Steve was putting the hops in, he had to do them like a few pallets at a time because every time the hops hit it, it just... Oh, really? Got right up to the lip, nearly came oh, over and then dropped funny. back down and a few more pallets. And a, uh, th is it a thousand litre we're doing that now on? Or <coughs> is it a um, we've got two 500s. Two fives, so yeah. um, we end up kind of half filling both of those because um, they're designed to, um, so roughly a thousand litres that we're making, but mm. um, 
they're designed to kind of boil 500 litres. We were filling them right to yeah, the top yeah, and really yeah. pushing the elements be hard. A, Again, we like to push yeah, things. <laughs> it would be a messy um, boil over anyway, yeah, the, um, having them kind of close to the half full for the boil just means that it hits the boil a lot quicker and it, it powers through it. So the brew days are significantly shorter um, than when it was working to boil twice as much liquid as it was designed to. Mm -hmm. Just took a long time to reach. Yep. To reach the temperatures and stuff. Um, I'm going to lift the mop pipe out while we're talking. Yeah, wait. Uh, were there any other questions? Or um, does that sort that of... Is, so, so far, um, just Eris, um, you did get a compliment on your hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so It was um, overdue. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really dyed it through lockdown because I'm kind of being the opposite of most people in lockdown. I've been like twice as busy as I normally am. Yeah, I know. So um, I, I'm so. kind of... I, I'm here six days a week um, and because we were so busy with everybody taking up hobbies at home and whatnot um, and being in the mail room as well, I, I just really didn't you get a chance to... That? Yeah, I might actually. You, if you hold the trivet, I will lift the melt pipe. Look at that. Teamwork. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't really, didn't really get a chance to um, to relax and do stuff at home like I would have perhaps liked to. Um, not saying that <laughs> lockdown was was a nice relaxing break for people, but um, the things that I would normally do um, for my leisure time at home, I didn't really have as much energy to do because I was working so hard here. Um, which we all were. Uh, it was it was it was a very busy. Very busy year for oh, us was, last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I kind of, the other weekend um, on Sunday, I was just like, huh, I have energy. I'm gonna run to run to the shops and grab some bleach and grab some dye and sort of see what happens. And so, yeah. Had a, and that was had the result of it, yeah. Nice. Came out well, actually. Um, I'm far from a professional hairdresser, so <laughs> my, um, my bleaching and dyeing skills aren't kind of too good. Um, but I watched a few videos which I've never done before and, um, and learned some new techniques and tips on, on proper hair bleaching um, and, and it helped a lot, so, yeah. YouTube's good for that. YouTube is um, good for that. You can learn all sorts of skills. Yeah, so uh, we've, we've just done the mash out. We've covered all the basics of this particular style. What do you think, Ben? I reckon we can probably um, call it. I think that's, uh, we hope that's educated, informed everyone of um, this, this perhaps not too familiar style for, for lots of people out there. Um, and yeah. uh, if you, uh, yeah, don't listen to the first bit where I talk about, <laughs> about the 1010. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put some kind of a, um, a chapter in there to saying skip from here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just say, um, don't worry That's about right. this. We figured it out later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as. Uh, we corrected it. It's uh, final gravity is 10, 16 to 10, 24 in that range. If, you, if you're going for style, you know, if you're really um, pushy for that. So let's wrap things up. Um, I mentioned our other videos. Um, Helen will be in towards the end of the month. Uh, Ben's just going to do a sparge here. Yeah, <laughs> if you're wondering what's going on Funnily there. Funnily enough, eight kilos of grain sucks out a bit of water out of your... Out of your um, so you're going to have to top, because uh, the grain's absorbed, it's so much water, you're going to have to add some water back, of course, to um, yeah. make up... And it'll be cold water loss. as well. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, another note, I don't know if we'll get around to it today, but we are going to be filming something pretty, pretty exciting um, coming up. Uh, it won't be a live stream. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a reveal of a new product, so stay tuned for that. Uh, as we said at the beginning, um, please do subscribe. You will always be notified when we upload new videos, and um, I think this is one that some, a lot of you might be interested in, in checking out. So stay tuned. We'll be, we'll be sort of, I don't know, drip-feeding teasers, um, I think, over the coming weeks. So thanks for watching. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Hope everyone is well out there um, and uh, staying safe. Um, you know, things are things are feeling pretty good here in Victoria at the moment. You never want to get too complacent, but um, uh, it feels like uh, the world is uh, making a bit of a turn for the better. 
Um, but uh, for us here at Grain and Grape, uh, happy brewing. Yeah. See you next time. See you. Yeah, where's the button? What's the button? That's